Thank you, thank you. Excited to be here. Hope you guys are having an amazing event. Uh, doing our little road trip with our family. So we drove from our lake house in Montana with eight of our 10 kids. So you might see them running around here. I think they're here, so I'm gonna raise your hand. That's my hand. Okay, there they are, there's my cheer section. Love you guys. And I'm excited to really dig into some tactical, practical things here on this presentation. So I wanna kind of really recenter back to, to business, to real estate, to wealth building. And I wanna to talk to you guys today about how to create your very own money printing press is how I like to refer to this. And who wouldn't like to have their own money printing press that prints you money again and again? And what I wanna do is I'm gonna be a little bit controversial, I think, in some of the things that I'm gonna share. Um, I'm gonna challenge a little bit of conventional wisdom, even within the real estate investing industry. And so tell me if you've heard of this statistic. By a show of hands, who has heard this statistic that 80 to 90% of millionaires invest in real estate? Has anybody heard that? Okay, quite a few of you. I heard that 20 years ago and inspired me to get into real estate. At the time, I was in my mid-20s, going nowhere, didn't really have direction, didn't really know how to create something better for myself. I just knew I wanted to. So when I heard the statistic, I thought, that's, where I've got to, that's what I've got to do. I've got to figure out real estate. And so I, I went down that road. But I quickly bought into some advice that I think is very poor advice. How many of you have heard that to get wealthy in real estate, you need to buy rental properties for cash flow and that the cash flow will be passive income. Who's heard this? Cash flow in real estate is passive. And that as soon as that passive income exceeds your living expenses, you're what? Financially free. Who's heard that? Yeah, I heard that and bought into that. And uh, I think I went out and acquired like 28 or so single family rental properties. And I quickly learned that that was not true. Uh, I quickly learned that you do not buy rentals for cash flow, at least for a long time, because any money that that rental property is going to generate has to go back into the property, if not soon, later, <laughs> sooner or later, because it'll, there'll be capital improvements like roofs and furnaces, and there'll be ongoing routine maintenance and repairs. All of that cash flow should go into a rainy day account or a war chest account for that day when it needs to go back into the property. Okay, and, if, and uh, who knows that firsthand that owns rental properties? Okay, so a lot of you, quite a few of you. And you probably experienced the same thing I did, which was, oh, I'm going to create all this cash flow. It'll be passive, and this is going to be amazing. In fact, uh, that was my experience with this property. Um, this was a textbook classic rental property for me. I had a tenant paying every single month. They paid on time. I thought it was amazing. I was making about $500 a month in, in net cash flow after everything, property management, principal interest, taxes, insurance, $500 a month, so about $6,000 a year. After two years of this tenant paying on time, like clockwork, every single month, they did not renew their lease. They moved out. I go into the property, and guess what? Needs carpet, needs paint, needs a bunch of things done. Spent $15,000 to get my rental property rent ready again and there went all my cash flow for two years. And so that's where I had this realization that you do not buy rental properties for cash flow. In fact, to prove this is true, how many of you have heard of a motivated seller type, lead type, called a tired landlord? Okay. Uh, this is actually one of my favorite seller leads is a tired landlord. What is a tired landlord? A tired landlord is somebody that went out and bought one, two, five, ten rentals quickly realized what? These rentals aren't making me financially free. I'm actually sick and tired of toilets, tenants, and turnover. And then they become a motivated seller to get rid of those rental properties. In fact, it happens so much that there's an entire class called tired landlords that we target, that we market to, to buy properties at a discount. The problem with rentals isn't necessarily that, it, it isn't that there's necessarily a problem with rental properties, the problem is that you're acquiring them for the wrong reason and at the wrong time. So let's talk about it. Let's go back to that statistic, 80 to 90% of millionaires own real estate. How do they do it? What do they do? Well, let me show you the path that they follow. They build a business and they own a business. And that business, if it's successful, 
when it's successful, produces a ton of cash. Then what happens with that cash? That excess cash is used to what? Acquire real estate. And why is it acquiring real estate? To eliminate taxes. This is the path of the wealthy. They create businesses that produce cash. They use that cash to acquire real estate. And the reason why they acquire that real estate is to eliminate their tax liability. That's why 80 to 90% of millionaires invest in real estate. Now, the rich are buying real estate for tax benefits because they understand that when you make money and you keep it, that's when you're financially free. And it's all because of this really cool thing called depreciation. What is depreciation? Depreciation is the incremental loss of an asset's value due to wear and tear over time. So if I take a building and I let that building sit in the elements, the IRS says in 27 and a half years, it will deteriorate to zero, okay? And the IRS also allows you to take the depreciation deduction on your taxes for the entire expected life of that property, which they classify as 27 and a half years for residential. What does that mean? Well, this is a property that I just bought by my lake house in Montana. Um, it needs a bunch of work. We're converting it into a duplex. Well, let's take the tax benefit. Why did I buy this? Not for cash flow, because what am I doing with the cash that this property creates? putting it right back into the property sooner or later. So I'm not counting on the cash flow. Now I want it to make positive cash flow and it will, hopefully. But the cash flow is just to maintain the property, that's it. That's why I want the cash flow. Really what's happening here is if I subtract the land value, this building has a $300,000 basis, which means over 27 and a half years, the IRS is letting me write off $11,000 a year and if I accelerate that and do a cost seg and take seven years up front in year one, I can eliminate $76,000 of tax liability in year one. What does that mean? That means if I have to pay the IRS $76,000, now I don't. So how much money did I make in year one on this property? $76,000 without doing anything else, like not counting anything else. Okay, so do you see why the wealthy buy real estate? This is why they buy real estate. They do not buy it for cash flow. They do not buy it for appreciation. They do not buy for principal pay down or for leverage. They buy for tax benefits. All of those other things are kind of like side benefits, right? We like those things. They're amazing. That makes it even better, but it's for the tax benefits. So I want to go back to this real quickly here. The path of the wealthy. You build a business. You own that business. You build that business. If you do it right, that business produces a lot of cash. It's kicking out that cash. That's going to put you in the highest tax bracket. If you're in the highest tax bracket, this, by the way, this is a conversation I had with Pat out in the hallway. Pat's like, Jerry, I'm going to owe a whole bunch of money in taxes. What do I do? I'm building my business. My business is kicking out a ton of cash. I don't want half of it to go to taxes, which it will. If you're married filing jointly and you're in the $450,000 income bracket, meaning your reportable income is, is over 400 and whatever, 17,000 or whatever it is, you're at the 37% tax bracket. That's federal. Throw state in there of six to 9%, whatever your state does, you're almost at 50% tax bracket. And what's really cool, I don't know if you guys realize this, but the tax code, taxes, the tax code says, hey, wealthy, we like you, you produce, you create jobs, you make the economy work. We want to incentivize you so that you keep producing. So we're going to give you these tax incentives. And real estate is one of the greatest vehicles for those tax incentives. So what does this look like? We're full circle here. What I want to kind of talk to you about now is, okay, well, great. How do you create your very own printing press? Um, and so I want to talk about how to do it with real estate. What's cool is you can create a money printing press right within real estate. It does not have to be a business outside of real estate. It certainly could. That's what a lot of, when you see that statistic of the millionaires and billionaires investing in real estate, many of them own businesses outside of real estate and like I said, funnel it into real estate. But you can actually create your, your very own money printing press within real estate. And um, I've gotten a lot of flack for saying this statement here, but I look at real estate investing like high school. Your freshman year is wholesaling. Your sophomore year is fix and flip. Your junior year is rentals. And your senior year is commercial or development or more advanced strategies. 
And what I mean by that is real estate is developmental, in my opinion. And I think the smartest path to building wealth is to developmentally progress through your real estate journey. And so why start with wholesaling? Why is wholesaling you know, your freshman year in real estate investing? And I've got a few reasons why. I think sourcing and finding, well, first of all, let me define wholesaling. Is everybody familiar with what wholesaling real estate is? Probably in this room. Wholesale real estate is where you source and find distressed properties. You're gonna contract to buy those properties at a discount. Then you take those properties to local active cash buyers in the market and you assign or flip, not the property, your contract to those buyers for a profit. That's essentially wholesaling. And the reason why I love wholesale real estate so much is because it's, it's simple, not easy, simple. <laughs> it's not easy, but it is very simple. The, the concept or the technique of wholesaling a house is a very simple concept. It's not overly complicated. There's nothing advanced about it. Now it's hustle, but it's not anything technically difficult. There's a very low barrier to entry with wholesale real estate. You can get involved very quickly. You can be getting your first deal this week, right? So it isn't this long process for you to enter into the wholesale industry. Uh, it's very low risk because you're not actually owning the property. When you own property, when you buy and take title to a property, inherently you take on a lot of risk because now you own this asset. Well, in wholesale real estate, you never own the asset. You own the paper and then you're flipping the paper. So it creates a very, it's a very low risk entry into real estate. You can start with absolutely zero. There are zero down marketing strategies to wholesale real estate. Who thinks that's pretty cool? That with, with literally more time but no money, you can start wholesaling houses. And if you do it right, it earns massive income. And so, like just this, just this month, in, I'm in multiple markets where we wholesale, and just in my Tacoma, Washington market, we assigned this property here in Port Orchard for 28,000, this one in Seattle for 88,000. These were assignments, you guys. Assignments, meaning I never owned the house, I never renovated it, I never did anything to it. We got the contract, assigned it to a cash buyer who then was going to renovate it or rent it or whatever they're gonna do, and we, and we made the cash, okay? So what does this look like when you look at a wholesale business? So one of the things that I like to teach, one of my big things in, in my training and, and on my content on YouTube is I try to have this conversation that is, is not how to go get a deal, which is what we always think about, especially when we're brand new, but rather how do I build a business that does deals? And isn't there a difference between chasing a deal and building a business that does deals? I mean, how many of you know... Um, or maybe even heard up on stage, Tiffany and Josh, hi. Yeah. You guys remember? Okay, that is building a business, right, isn't it? Everybody get that? They're not running around doing deals. What are they doing? Building. They're building a business that does deals. And I asked Tiffany, I said, Tiffany, um, you know, as you're a mother and things going on in your life, what does it look like for you to step aside from the business? And she said, Jerry, I'm in the owner's box of my business. Meaning what? If you're in the owner's box, what does that mean? It means it's a real business because the business is functioning on all cylinders without you being in the trenches. That's what it, that's what it means to own a business. A true business it means you're in the owner's box. It doesn't mean you're not working because you're certainly leading, developing your team, creating vision, but, sh but the business is functioning without you in the trenches, doing the day-to-day -day operations. So in a typical wholesale business, the, the national industry average for a wholesale deal, last I checked, was around $14,000, okay, national average. So let's just hypothetically take year one of your wholesale journey, and this is, again, this is like all in, I'm gonna, I'm gonna build a wholesale business, what I've seen over and over again, what I've helped my students do, and what Ryan does in his program, is creates a business structure that will allow you to really win at this. So what does that look like? In year one, let's just say that you're averaging 10,000 a deal. You do two deals a month, that's $240,000 a year. And you can do that right now today with zero marketing budget as a solo operator, no team. Who thinks that's cool? That's kind of cool, isn't it? That's, that's pretty cool, and, but I mean, let's be real, it's kind of a high paying job, right? It's not really a business at this stage, year one, why? 
Because you're wearing all the hats. Yeah, so you're wearing all the hats. So, you know, why work, why work nine hours a day for somebody else when you can work, you know, 14 for yourself, right? <laughs> That's kind of this phase, yeah. So you're, you're, a, you're a solo operator. You're running around wearing all the hats, uh, but you're, you're making pretty good money for a solo operator. But let's look at it now at scale. So let's now look at that same model at scale. Let's say now that you're averaging $20,000 a deal. Okay, so you increase your, your minimum deal size. And let's say now you've dialed in a, a business, meaning you've got, you've got uh, people on the phones, you've got people that go on appointment, you've got people that close with cash buyers, you've dialed in your marketing, you're running a legit business. Now you're doing eight deals a month, that's $2 million a year gross. Now that's gross, you have cost, but that's gross. With a, very, with a very low overhead, small team business model doing $2 million a year. That, my friends, is your printing press. Okay, that's a printing press. And I didn't realize this. I've been doing wholesaling for 20 years and teaching wholesaling for 20 years. I didn't realize until the last few years that there's an emergence in the wholesale industry of mega wholesalers. I call them mega wholesalers. And this is the Josh and Tiffany's doing 500 a million a month in wholesale real estate with almost the same size team as the wholesalers doing that much in a year. Same team doing a million a month that most wholesale operations do in a year. Now why? Why is their same size team doing a million a month, not a million a year? What's the difference? Really good leadership. Really good team, really good systems. Really good development, really good development. There is a very strong culture in those organizations for growth and development. And that's, that's Josh and Tiffany, right? I mean, if you know them, and that's Ryan, Ryan Pineda. If you look at his business model, how they operate, very, very big into developing their teams. A lot of effort, a lot of emphasis goes into leadership, goes into team building, and that's why he's able to grow those businesses so successfully. And again, now I'm talking business in general, like with, with Ryan, multiple businesses, multiple printing presses, okay? And so there's some good news and there's some bad news, right? The good news is that uh, you're gonna create a printing press when you, if you go this route, like if you wanna say, hey, how do I build my own printing press within real estate since I like real estate? with a wholesale real estate business, you're gonna create, you're gonna start printing cash. And then what else are you gonna do? That's gonna put you in that top tax bracket. So now you've created a little bit of a problem, right? Great problem to have. I always say I would rather make money and pay taxes than not make money and not pay taxes. But I prefer to make money and not pay taxes too. And so the secret then is to then acquire assets, okay? Uh, but going back real quick, um, but the thing that I want to talk about here, the, the message I'm hoping to say right now is that acquiring assets is developmental, meaning it's timing. It's about the timing. And so what I tell my wholesale partners and what I coach people and my advice would be, wait a second to start acquiring assets. Until when? You've built your printing press and you're in a high tax bracket, that's when it's time to start acquiring assets. Until then, hyper-focus on what? Building your printing press, whatever that might look like for you. I think wholesale real estate business is the best business to build a printing press. And then at that point, it's time to start buying those rental properties or assets that give you the tax benefits. Um, and one of the things that I want to take a minute and touch on, because I have been so tactical, is when I talk about developmental, like I look at my own personal life of 20 years now in real estate, and in the beginning there was this hyper focus on income, right, making money, and that was like front and center all the time. How do I make money? How do I make money? Uh, who can relate to that? Like it's constantly in the back of your mind. How do I make money? And then, and then the focus shifts a little bit to, okay, well, I'm making money now. How do I create my dream lifestyle? Right, whatever that looks like for you. How do I do that? And so then you put a lot of focus into that lifestyle. What does my lifestyle need to look like for me to really consider myself successful? And so you put a bunch of emphasis in that. And then hopefully you transition into impact. And impact is what? 
The impact phase of your journey is when you start thinking about how you can give back at scale, right, to a, in a big way to a lot of people. And that's one of the things that, that most attracts me to Ryan and his organization, and, is, uh, and you guys all know this, is a, a strong emphasis in your spirituality, a strong emphasis in doing good to the world and creating a way to bless other people's lives. And that's that impact phase. So how do we do that, right? How do we think about, okay, well, you know, I'm here at this conference. I want to, I want to build something. It usually starts with I want, I want to, the income for my own self and for my family. I want to improve my life. Then I want to have a better lifestyle. And then hopefully I've got these big things that I want to make a difference in the world and have an impact. And so it's being very intentional about that. Thinking through that very clearly, very carefully. I didn't for many years. Uh, I was just so focused on building my business that I didn't really have a strong vision for, for what the whole picture could look like. And, and my wife and I are really trying to take a step back and really start to th- and really try to think about, well, why are we doing this? And what, what meanings do we have? And what message do we want to share? And how do we want to impact others and bless lives? And I just feel so blessed and fortunate to be at a place where that is a priority. And I want to encourage you to, as you're thinking about building your own printing press, to also be thinking about what's the bigger picture? What is it that I'm hoping to do? Uh, my wife, when she does some coaching with uh, our students, she'll do this exercise where she'll ask, um, you know, if you're on your deathbed and you've got three minutes till lights out and you were to say, you know, what would I want? What would I have hoped my life would have been like? What experiences do I wish I had? And then you were able to make a list and do this exercise right now and make that list and then reverse engineer and say, what things do I need to do? Look in the mirror and say, what changes do I need to make? And most of the time, you're going to not be happy with that and there's going to be changes to make. It should be that way because that's how you develop as a human is you self-confront, really be, have that self-awareness, which is one of the hardest things for us to do as humans is have self-awareness. Really ask yourself, what things do I want my life to really be like? And what changes do I need to make today to move in that direction? And, uh, and so I only had a few minutes up here, and I wanted to share this message with you guys. Um, I feel so fortunate and blessed to have this opportunity. I'm grateful for all of you. Thank you for your time here. And, uh, and I'll be around the rest of today. If you guys catch me in the hall, I'd love to meet you and talk to you. And that's what I've got for you. So thank you, everybody. Yep, you're welcome. Awesome. Thank you, guys.